this comes from a chapter, again, where we're going through Dr. John R. Rice's book, and he has a chapter entitled Praying Through. Now, have you ever heard that expression? Praying Through. It's not a term so often used today, but in Dr. Rice's day, it was an expression that was used and sometimes misused. There is a proper use of the term, and then there is an improper use of the term. So in this chapter, Dr. Rice deals with first how it shouldn't be used, and then how we should and we ought to persist in prayer. That's really the idea of being persistent in prayer. So let's just read John chapter 1, verse 12, as we start tonight, and let's read it together. John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Let's pray. Father, please work now in our in our hearts, dear God. Give us a greater understanding of the truth of salvation and of prayer. And Lord, teach us to be persistent as you taught us always to pray and not to faint, dear Lord. Help us to be like that widow who kept going to that unjust judge until her request was answered. And how much more can we come to you who is a just and loving and kind and merciful father and you will hear our prayers. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for hearing the prayers of your people regarding this container with very important supplies on it. Thank you that it's it's loosed from the port of Benin and it's now on its journey up to the clinic. We pray for it to have a safe journey and a safe arrival so all the materials can be unpacked and used for your glory. So please work now and in this time in Jesus' name, amen. So Dr. Rice talks about praying through, and the first thing he says about this is that sinners do not have to pray through for salvation. In other words, do you want to be saved? You don't have to go, like one preacher told Dr. Rice, he said, if you come to the mourner's bench three nights in a row, I guarantee salvation for you. Dr. Rice says, that doesn't guarantee salvation at all, to go to a mourner's bench even three nights in a row. What guarantees salvation? Jesus, he's the one who guarantees salvation. You don't have to go to a mourner's bench three nights. You have to repent of your sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in a tenth of a second. And you can be saved. So Rice says it's unscriptural, it's hurtful, it's wrong to emphasize the idea that you have to pray through for salvation. What are people often looking for when they have this concept they're looking for a feeling they're looking to be praying and praying and begging god save me and save me and save me and they're mourning or they they're looking for an emotion they're looking for a feeling i used to hear howard camping on family radio talk like this like when people would call them and say that i want to be saved and howard camping you remember him yes of the Jesus is going to come back in May, fame, and he never came back, as Camping said he would. But I would often hear Harold Camping tell people to beg God and beseech God and just pray. And if you're of the elect, then you will be saved. And it didn't matter. If you weren't elected, it didn't matter how long you prayed. Well, that's not scriptural. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. So one does not have to seek long after God before the Lord will forgive us and save us. Salvation is not by feeling. Salvation is by grace through faith. Jesus paid the price for our salvation. We do not have to pray through to be saved. So what are some Bible verses that do back up that what Christ is saying and what I fully and wholeheartedly agree? Well, the verse that we read, but as many as what? Received him. To them gave you the power to become the sons of God. That is the authority. When you receive Jesus Christ, you are a son of God. You are a child of God. You have all the rights of sonship is the idea there. You, you have the authority to become his child when you believe in him. You can claim that sonship by faith in Jesus Christ. It says, even to them that believe on his name. And here's the mystery as well. Of election and even the next verse which were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but of God so yes the new birth is of God but it's for those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ 
Look at John chapter 3, a couple verses in John chapter 3 and verse 36, John the Baptist preaching. And what does John say in his preaching? He says, the father loveth the son and hath given all things into his hand. Verse 36, can we read it together? He that believeth on the son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the son shall not see light, but the wrath of God abideth on him. You know what's amazing? That when John the Baptist preached that, it was true. And it's just as true right now. Truth is true. So John the Baptist was preaching this when Jesus was visible to him. And he says, he that believeth on the Son has, has, that is present. That moment, you have eternal life. When you what? What's the condition? When you believe. So either you have the Son and have everlasting life, or it says you don't have the Son. And if you don't have the Son, what do you have? The wrath of God. You're either a possessor of life or a possessor of wrath. Right now, every man. John chapter 5, verse 24 is another verse on this. And there are so many, but we'll just, I think, stop after this verse and go to the next point. But John chapter 5, verse 24, here is Jesus teaching. And what does he say? John 5, 24. Let's read it together. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And so, again, the same exact condition. Jesus says, right now, if you hear, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me, believes on the Father who has sent me, you have everlasting life. If you believe that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world, that Jesus is Lord who died on the cross, who buried, he's alive. Right this moment, right now, you have real life. That's the promise of God. Somebody went and said, I'm ready to really trust Christ as my Savior. They went and they were counseled by a godly counselor and they prayed with him. And he came out, and Dr. Rice says, are you sure right now if you were to die that you'd go to heaven? And he said, yes, Dr. Rice, I'm sure. I don't feel the way I want to feel, but I know that the Bible says I'm saved. <laughs> so, again, we're not saved by how we feel. You know, somebody might tell you they were saved and they had a particular emotion, and maybe sometimes other people think that they have to have that emotion. Well, different people will have different emotions. You agree with me? Some people might cry, but do you have to cry when you're saved? As long as you are sorry for your sins and you're turning from your sin and you're turning from to, to the Lord Jesus Christ, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what are some Bible examples of that? Who were, in other words, they were saved immediately. What are some Bible examples of that? How about the woman Jesus met at the well? John chapter 4, verse 26. Go back just one scripture since we're right in John 5. And Jesus was having this conversation with her. And she says in verse 25, I know the Messiah comes, who's called Christ. And Jesus says in verse 26, what? I that speak unto you, I'm me. I'm the Messiah. And right there, she must have believed. Because it says in verse 28, the woman left her water pot. She had real water now. She left the thing that she went out there to actually do, and that was to get water. She left the water pot, and now she ran into the town, and verse 29, she says, Come see a man that told me all things that I've ever done. Is not this the Mashiach, the Messiah, right? She believed. How about the thief who was dying on the cross? What did he have to do to be saved? Just with faith. Call upon the Lord. That's what you need to be to do to be saved. Lord, what does it say in Luke chapter 23 and verse 42? What is that verse? Jesus told the thief, or the thief asked the Lord. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. 
He didn't pray through. He just prayed. <laughs> he prayed in faith. He called on the name of the Lord. And the Lord said, today you will be with me. I mean, if the Lord could save that guy in that condition, he could save whosoever will. That man was a thief dying for his crimes, and yet the Lord saved him. And that day, he, he, he went from a, from a cross of pain to a paradise of complete joy in the presence of God. That's our hope. Look at Acts chapter 2. There are many Bible examples of people instantly saved and then changed, transformed the day of Pentecost. What was the result of that day? What happened that day? That very day, Acts chapter 2, they heard Peter's sermon. Peter preached in the power of the Holy Spirit the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the exaltation of Christ. And he laid the responsibility of Christ's death on his ears, on those who were listening to him. You have taken this Messiah and with wicked hands have crucified him, but he's alive. And then they said, well, what shall we do? And Peter says, repent in the name of Jesus Christ. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then it says, verse 41, then they that gladly received his word were what? Were baptized. They were baptized because they had done what? Repented. Now, some verses say believe. Some verses say repent. Some verses say repent and believe. If you truly believe, you repent. If you truly repent, you believe. You cannot biblically repent and not believe. And you cannot biblically believe without repenting. If you do the one biblically, you de facto will do the other. There's two sides of the same coin. Believe is a turning to and repentance is a turning from. And you cannot turn to unless you're turning from. You turn to Jesus and you're turning from sin. You can't turn to Jesus and still be turning to sin. It's impossible. So repent and believe are two sides of the same coin. So this says repent in Acts 2.38. And those who received his word, that is who truly repented, that day, that day, they were baptized. And there's so many examples of this in the book of Acts. Just consider a couple more. Look at Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16 and verse 14. Paul and Philippi. A certain woman named Lydia. Seller of purple the city of Thyatira. She, was a, she had immigrated, by the way. She had immigrated from Thyatira, from Asia, across the, the GNC to Macedonia, to Philippi. And I always love this because, you know, when Paul was on this missionary journey, he sought to go to Asia. But the Lord did not let him. The Lord suffered him not. But the first person he met where God did lead him to Macedonia, and he went to the city of Philippi. The first person he did meet was a woman from Asia. So here was Paul. Do you follow what I'm saying? He was on a missionary journey, and he tried to go to Asia. And God said no. But God didn't forbid him from going to Asia because he didn't love the people of Asia. I believe God wanted him in Macedonia at that moment because God knew he could reach the people from even Asia in Macedonia, people from all over the world. It's a very ethnic diverse area of Macedonia. So anyway, she was from Thyatira, the Asian city. It says, which worshiped God. That is, she was a Gentile. She believed in God to the best of her understanding, but she hadn't understood Christ. But she heard Christ of uh, Paul. He, she heard of Christ through Paul. She heard us whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended to the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized, so she was saved right there. How was she saved? The Lord saved her. What does it say the Lord did? Opened up her heart. To do what? What, what did she do? The Lord opened up her heart to what? 
to repent and believe <laughs> on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord has to open people's hearts. We need to pray that God will do that. That's one reason why we are here, because our city, it seems in our nation, it's like the minds have become blind and the hearts have become closed. Lord, open up people's hearts to believe in Jesus. That's our prayer. And then right at the end of this chapter, or toward the end, the Philippian jailer, you know, the famous story of the jailer, the man on the doorstep of death. And there with a sword pressed to his, to his heart, and he's about to, to kill himself. He's about to puncture his heart with a sword. And Paul got between this man and eternity, this man in hell, and said, wait, don't, don't hurt yourself. Acts chapter 16, verse 28. Do thyself no harm. Don't kill yourself. And he came and he fell down. He knew that Paul and Silas had something that he needed. He had heard them singing praises while they were in that dung-infested, dark prison, that inner cell where there was no sanitation, no nothing except filth and awful conditions that are indescribable. But yet they were praising God. And God brought down the house when they were singing. That's what they, you know, God was so happy with their with their singing. He brought down the house with an earthquake, it seems. But anyway, the Philippian jailer comes and he says, what must I do, verse 30, to be what? Be saved. And what did Paul say? Well, you have to tarry long. And if, if you're the elect, then God will save you. Is that what we tell people? Absolutely not. You know who the elect are? The ones who believe and repent. That's the, don't worry about whether somebody's alive. That's not our business. That's God's business. Don't worry about that. We can challenge, we can call everyone to come to Christ. And we can challenge everyone to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone we meet, we can tell them, Jesus died on the cross for your sins. I believe that with all my heart. I could meet anyone, any person in this world and say, Jesus Christ died for your sins. Believe on him. That's what we tell them. That's the message. And the Lord opened up the jailer's heart to that. And not only that, Paul said, not only will you be saved, but your house. And look what it says. He took them the same hour of the night. Now he wasn't, this is kind of weird. He wasn't afraid to take them out of the prison now. Before he was afraid that, he, that they had left, he would be killed. But now he's like fearless. And it says he took them the same hour, washed their stripes, and was baptized. He and all his. And what's the last word of verse 33? Straightway. You know what that word means? What does it mean? It means without any delay. Immediately. So he was saved and followed the Lord immediately in, in baptism. You know, I don't, I don't see a problem in waiting between salvation and baptism if you need to. Be instructed and many times people have a lot of strange ideas and there's there's some discipleship that we often see is is of value before somebody gets baptized after their salvation but biblically there does not have to be a delay if they understand that they are saved they are ready to be baptized biblically speaking and not only him but all of his family so what does that tell you about his family, by the way? He didn't have any babies at home. They were all old enough to understand Jesus and get baptized. Because babies don't get baptized. It says, he and all his, straightway. And Paul had said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved and your house. So his house would be saved. How would they be saved? They would what? They would believe. How would they believe? How do we know somebody believed? They confess with their mouth. So ask a baby if they believe. They're not going to say, you know, it may be taught that they believe. They're not going to be able to understand. I had somebody tell me one time, you know, when I was having this discussion about infant baptism, he said, well, faith is, is a real mystery, you know, and so maybe those babies believe. Hogwash. If you confess with your mouth, 
That's how we know somebody believes. And if you believe in your heart, how do you know, how do we know somebody believes in their heart? They confess with their mouth. They have to do that. And so obviously, so some people take scriptures like this. Do you know that? Some people take scriptures like this and say, you see, infant baptism is biblical. Because it says the Philippian jailer's house, all of them were baptized. <laughs> but it doesn't say that there were any babies in the house. They're reading into it. It does say they all believed. And in order to believe, as we went through that, all right. But now, in the last few moments, Dr. Wright says, while we do not have to pray through for salvation, and there are specific scripture verses that say that we do not have to pray through, and there are many examples that say we do not have to pray through for salvation. We can be saved the moment we believe. Christians, he say, ought to pray through with long continued supplications, waiting upon God, fasting, and not giving in to quitting prayer, but to not faint until God answers prayer. In other words, pray through till God breaks through. So let's look at just a couple of examples. Go to Daniel chapter 9. And again, there are many examples that we could look at. But Daniel, and if you wanted to read two examples, actually Daniel 9 and 10, we'll just kind of do a fly over some of these passages. But Dr. Rice says that people ought to pay the price of heart searching, of fasting, of confession of sin. When God's people pray through, they can have revival, protection, provision, the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. Pray through. In other words, if you believe God wants to give you something or do something for you, pray through. Don't stop praying until God answers that prayer. So here in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel prayed through. He set his face to seek God. It says in verse 2 of Daniel 9, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So what book was Daniel reading? He's reading the Bible. And specifically what book of the Bible? He's reading the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah had said that Israel would go into captivity for how many years? 70 years. You know what? When you read the Bible, it should set you praying. In one way or another. If you read a psalm, it should lead you to prayer. Daniel had read that Israel would be in captivity for 70 years. You know what he realized? He was in the 67th of the 70th year. Three more years and the 70 would be up. So Daniel says, we've got to pray through on this. Because right now, the temple in Jerusalem was in what condition? It was in ashes. And... Daniel wanted God's face to shine on that temple, and so he's going to have to pray through on this. So Daniel, in verses 1 through 3, gives his full attention to God. I set my face to the Lord to seek by prayer, supplications, with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. He gives his full attention to God. Verse 4, he gives him true adoration and praise. Lord, you're great, you're awesome, you're dreadful, you're faithful, you keep your covenant, you keep your promises, you're merciful. And then he offers a humble admission of sin. Verse 5, what are the first three words there of Daniel 9, 5? We have sinned. Daniel doesn't say, man, the people out there have sinned so many sins, I haven't done anything bad, but they are wicked, God. <laughs> Daniel doesn't say that. I th and I believe we need to enter into the sins of our culture because we have sinned. We have sinned. If there's sin out there, if there's sin in here for us to confess, we have sinned. And with humble admission, he confesses over and over again. To us belong confusion of face. That is we're ashamed. There was a shame, a shame for his sin. And again in verse 8, it says, we have sinned. And then Daniel not just gives his full attention, true adoration, 
a humble admission of sin, but then an intense appeal to God. Down in verse 16 and 17. Look what he says in verse 17. Now, therefore, O God, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. And just think of that. Daniel is asking God's face to shine on ashes. But Daniel sees a sanctuary. He sees what will be built, what had not yet begun to be built. But Daniel, with eyes of faith, says, shine on that place where the sanctuary will be rebuilt. You know, and we need to pray like that. We need to pray with such faith. God, cause your face to shine on the ashes of impossibility. So we need to ask God for our project grow open. Shine on us, Lord, because we're asking for a miracle. Shine on our poverty. Shine on our bank account, you know, where we need you to build it up. Shine on my life to answer a particular prayer, whatever it is. So here is Daniel's brokenhearted prayer for a broken nation. I think this is a great prayer for us, actually. A brokenhearted prayer for a broken and a nation that had sinned against God. And Daniel offers no excuses. He casts no blame. He accepts responsibility. And he confesses his sins. He prays through. Look in Nehemiah. Nehemiah, please. We'll have time for just a couple more, but I love Nehemiah. Nehemiah prayed through. Nehemiah, Nehemiah had a cushy job, didn't he? What was his job? You know what his job was? You know what Nehemiah's job was? Eating. I, I'm not giving that job up, man. I get to eat the king's food. That's like the best food around. That would be the best food. He was the king's cupbearer. And he would just make sure that nobody had poisoned the king's food or drink. And uh, I guess nobody had poisoned it because Nehemiah was still alive. So he, it, it was going good. But yet he heard what was going on in Jerusalem. And he set his face to God when he heard that the walls were broken down and burned with fire. And verse 4 of Nehemiah chapter 1. It says, and it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Did he just pray one time? No, there was a persistence there. There was a praying through. And Nehemiah was willing to leave it all behind and go. And that's eventually what happened. But look what it says in verse 5. I love his prayer. He says, I beseech the O Lord God of heaven. The great and terrible God, that means he's awesome, that keeps covenant and mercy, that means he's faithful and he's full of compassion, love, In, in, infinite mercy, grace, that word mercy is that has said, for them that love him and observe his commandments. And now he says, let thine ear, and what's the word after ear? That's the word that I like. Yeah. Now. That shows urgency. I mean, so Nehemiah is praying a prayer that basically he's saying, God, you've got to hear this prayer now. When we feel that way about a particular situation, we will pray through. We have to have that urgency. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of thy servant. We have to have that kind of passion. For God to hear us now. I cannot live if you don't hear this prayer now. And he says the same thing in verse number 11. Where he says, O Lord, I beseech thee. Let, where's the word? Now. There it is. Let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant. And to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name. Who prosper and prosper, I pray thee. Thy servant to this day, grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. So Daniel, uh, Nehemiah's prayer was, Lord, you have to hear now. I pray God will give us that kind of urgency and passion to pray for the needs of others. 
as well as our needs. For God to rebuild the broken walls of our church, of our families, of our city. So many examples of praying through. Let's just look at one final example. Go to Acts chapter 12, please, and we'll stop with just one verse in Acts chapter 12. We could talk about how the missionary church prayed through until God raised up laborers. The church prayed through until the power of the Holy Spirit was poured out. Ezra prayed through, begging God for protection until God's hand was on them so that the enemy's hand would not be on them. So many examples of praying through. But Acts chapter 12, verse 5, what was going on in Acts 12? What was happening? A major persecution in Jerusalem. Now, the church had already been persecuted, and they had been scattered, and churches had been established. But here was a unique and awful persecution, because what happens in Acts chapter 12, verse 2? What happens? Historically, this is an immense moment, actually. This is an incredible moment. In the history of the church, what happens? The brother of the Apostle John, the first apostle, is martyred. Wow, you think about that. A man personally chosen by Jesus Christ to be his sent one, to go into all the world, didn't make it out of Jerusalem. He's martyred for his faith. And now they've got Peter in prison. The, the chief spokesman, the, the preacher of the, on the day of Pentecost, the apostle Peter, really in that inner circle. This would be the second inner circle disciple. It was John, James, and Peter, right? Those are the three. And now Peter's in, in prison, and he is scheduled. Maybe they even have it scheduled for him to bring him forth after the Passover to have him killed. But notice the church didn't give up. Acts 12, verse 5. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. But prayer was made. It seemed impossible. The power was in the, in the political spectrum. They had the power. They had the sword. Peter was in prison. There was soldiers guarding him. This was an impossible situation. James was dead and Peter was next. But prayer was made. How? Without ceasing. And who made the prayer? Who's going to pray? Who is going to make this prayer? The church. Who cares? Other than the church. Who cares about Peter in prison at this moment? The world doesn't care about him. The ones who cared about him was the church. And God was watching over his man in prison. And God was watching over his church. And you know the story. The angel breaks into the prison and gets Peter out. And he, he knocks on the door where the prayer meeting was. And Rhoda comes. Is that her name? Rhoda? And Rhoda comes to the door. And she said, who's there? And and uh, he said, it's Peter. And she was so excited. She didn't even open the door for him. I just think that has got to be one of the funniest things in the Bible. That God broke Peter out of jail. And he couldn't even break into the prayer meeting. <laughs> I mean, he couldn't even get, he couldn't even get in the prayer meeting. God broke him out of the prison. And they, and then they went back and Rhoda said, is this her name? Did I say it right? They said, she said, Peter's at the door. They say, you're mad. You're crazy. They didn't even think God could answer their prayer. That's what, exactly what they were praying for. They said, it's his angel. And they said, no. Verse 16, look what it says, Peter. Continue knocking. <laughs> He's like, let me in, let me in. I want to pray with you guys. So, anyway, God is good. May we be a church. May we be a people where prayer is made. It says, without ceasing, they prayed through until Peter was broken through that prison. So we may, may we pray through until God breaks through. And may God hear and answer our prayers. You know, I know sometimes it's discouraging to be praying over a particular matter. And it just seems like, when? I've been praying for this even for years. Well, what can I say? I cannot say. If God has put that on your heart to pray for, pray through. Without ceasing, God will break through.